My name's Ted Bernhard. Uh, I'm a, for those of you who are in the previous session, I'm a corporate securities and tax attorney. So if there are any carryover questions from that that you'd like to address, uh, I'm happy to talk afterwards. Um, this, this session is entitled Horror Stories. Um, I already scared off a few people with the title <laughs> so far, <laughs> but I, I kind of like it. I mean, uh, I feel like uh, for whatever reason, the, the horror ethos, if you will, kind of captures this moment in human existence and particularly in this industry quite well. Um, so anyway, enough of the dramatic, uh, overly dramatic build up here. Uh, the origin of this speech was really a conversation that uh, Mary Lou Burton, who's the uh, founder and, and coordinator of this conference, and I had at one of the more recent um, Oregon Retail Cannabis Association meetings. And um, as it happened, Mary Lou and I started talking to each other at this session and just comparing notes about different deals that we were working on and uh, talking about the conference and networking and things like that. But the more um, she and I started talking, we kept finding that the conversation invariably like kept veering back to all the real life horror stories that we were seeing with our our clients. Now don't get me wrong, I'm a, I'm a good lawyer and Mary Lou's very good at what she does and so we've protected a lot of our clients from these horror stories but just the sheer um, amount of, uh, of, of all right, scams and, and stories that were, are trickling through this industry and to, down to us as service providers and intermediaries was uh, sort of a s staggering. Right before the right before the presentation today here, uh, Mary Lou came over to me and gave me this list of uh, invitations that she sent out to the conference. She said she sent out 1,900 invitations, and this pile right here represents all of the returned addresses with no forwarding address of companies that have gone out of business within the last, well, since the last conference. And so, you know, that should... That's just Washington. And that's just Washington, thank you, yes. <laughs> so, um, so if that's not an indication that there's, there's something um, to be aware of here, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, what is. So anyway, since, since Mary Lou and I had that initial conversation, uh, it must have been like three or four months ago, um, I've honestly spent way too many hours thinking about this topic and wondering to myself, why, why, why are we here right now? Um, I, just by way of background, I've, I've, been, I've been in this uh, business one way or another for about 25 years now. I started off as a venture capital investor, uh, then I uh, practiced law at a big law firm, and, and I've, I've been working pretty much throughout that entire period with entrepreneurs and emerging industries. And so I... Um, you know, I've seen a lot of different companies, a lot of different individuals and, and industries over that period of time. By the way, it's kind of fun to be, finally be the old gray-haired dude that can tell his war stories from his past couple decades. But that aside, um, the, uh, uh, what, the question that kept coming to my mind over and over again was, is what I'm seeing now, is this, is this different than what's been happening in the past? Or is this just another... Uh, just another cycle of the same old type of thing that we've we've seen before. Um, you know, I, I lived through the go-go days of the, the internet world, the mortgage boom and bust cycle in the mid 2000s, the clean energy tax credits, all that sort of stuff. And I just keep I just kept wondering to myself: is this is this truly different, or is uh, uh, is it just more of the same type of thing? Um, anyway, so as I was as I was as I was thinking about that. Uh, question the other day over morning paper over the morning paper I came across an interesting headline in the Washington Post it was about the uh, the fry festival I don't know if you've heard about that music fest that was a, a, a scam right <laughs> um, and the headline was yes in the Washington Post it takes two Fry Festival documentaries to fully convey how easily we're all scammed. Now, I admit I laughed when I read that. I thought that was pretty funny. But I, it, it got my attention enough to start reading the article uh, again. And, and in the middle of the article, there was this quote that, that, that stuck with me. Uh, the the, the uh, author said, it's no surprise that the 20th century, 21st century is rife with epic degrees of fraud and gullibility. It can be as simple as, as someone creating a self-image on social media that is so enviably perfect that they become a paid influencer, 
simply on the fantasy that they're cooler than you. It can also be co as complicated as an off-failed businessman rebranding himself as getting elected president. I'm not going to comment on that. But the, the part of the quote that I thought was interesting, he said, in the millennium era, scamming is in the very air that we breathe. And this is a, this is a senior writer for uh, the New Yorker magazine. And I stopped and I said, whoa, that scamming is in the very air that we breathe? That's quite a statement. Um, you know, but it, it, it just reinforced uh, exactly what I'd been sensing and what Mary Lou had been sensing. And I also know from just the two presentations that I've thought, sat through so far today, uh, both of the speakers mentioned that this is a, a, a growing and recurring problem in this industry. And um, so uh, that's, that's what sort of was the genesis of this, uh, this, uh, this speech. And before I jump into, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk in the abstract throughout the whole time, uh, and, but before I, I um, do jump into sort of some specifics about um, what are the scams that are out there, how do you recognize them, how do you protect yourself, what do you do if you get scammed, and I am going to talk about all of those things. Uh, I wanted to kind of float a, a, a thesis and a theory that maybe will uh, give you some idea of, of what we're seeing right now. As I, as I thought about this, thinking about all the different um, um, scams and, 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 and not scams that I've seen over the past couple of decades, uh, it strikes me that um, when you distill it all, in, the, in previous decades, what we were seeing, quite honestly, they were just flat out fraudy, sketchy, get rich quick, money making type schemes from players that were clearly outside of the traditional investor, entrepreneur, venture capital, private equity ecosystem. Um, and the, the, their scams were pretty transparent. They were essentially designed to fleece naive investors out of uh, their capital with basically no recourse through the promise of painting a grandiose vision of, of quick riches without much effort. And so the legitimate players back in, in those days, and we're not talking that far ago, like 10, 15 years ago, um, for whatever reason, had been kind of ingrained with this respect for the entrepreneurial ecosystem and what the structure of um, investment uh, and return looked like. And uh, there, there was sort of a, a, an unspoken mutual respect for the entrepreneur and an understanding that there's no way to get rich super quick. It takes a long, hard process of capital and labor working together under the guidance of the entrepreneurs uh, over years, maybe decades, to actually build a company. And that doesn't happen overnight. It, you have to build the company's culture, the customer base, the technology, all those things. And so there was this sort of unspoken understanding that anything that was too good to be true, um, and anything that was uh, you know, promising riches overnight was probably too good to be true and shouldn't be trusted. And so those people got kind of kicked out of the, they got recognized early on and then kicked out of the sort of traditional financial, private equity, investment banking, IPO, you know, infrastructure. But what we're seeing now, and this is what's the most disturbing part to me right now, is that uh, unlike those older scams, what we're seeing right now is that the players really appear to be a part of and like very involved with the actual ecosystem that's operating in the industry, particularly in the cannabis industry. It, it, I think we're seeing it across all um, early stage companies, but particularly the cannabis industry. Um, and the way I would kind of describe that is that, well, I don't, I don't know, I can't explain why this is happening, but what's happened is that you have these uh, shysters, these fraud artists, these scammers that have somehow ad adopted the language of entrepreneurship, of long-term value, of partnership for mutual benefit, and they've weaponized it. And they are using those terms that traditionally sort of were the indicators to people that, um, that you're dealing with legitimate players and manipulate those, th that language and those promises towards their own sort of selfish ends, which usually in, in, in this context kind of revolves around grabbing as much of the pie as you can, uh, that the money that's on the table immediately as fast as you can and getting away without getting caught. And so it's very, it's very different and it's very deceptive from what 
uh, we used to be seeing um, before. And so, um, you know, I, I think that calls that difference is material, and I think it also calls for um, you know increased uh, vigilance in, in in being aware of of this this sort of new breed of scams. Which, frankly, I mean, some of the things I've seen in the past year, and you'll hear about some of these, um, have have shocked me completely at just the the sheer brazenness of the 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 scams that the the the. the uh, untruthfulness while mouthing the right words uh, that, that that has truly astonished me. So, anyway, with that sort of cheerful introduction out of the way, um, I, I do want to kind of shift gears and turn this into something very practical for you guys to, to hopefully uh, get us out of the abstract realm and into what you can do to avoid um, getting conned and scammed in this in this real world of, of cannabis entrepreneurship in, in the year 2019. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk kind of about the preliminary warning signs that, that should set off red flags that you might be dealing with a scam, not necessarily. Uh, then I'm going to uh, talk real quickly about uh, what to do when you're getting that, that sense that something is awry, how you can protect yourself, and I'm, I'm sure most of you know a lot of the you know, common sense things that, that you would do, but it, it, you'd be amazed how many people don't, don't actually follow them. Um, then I'm going to get to the heart of the presentation, and I'm going to actually walk you through uh, what I think are the, the most common and most severe uh, scams that, that, uh, that I've been seeing and hearing about that I think you're likely to come in contact with if you're in this, uh, if you're in this industry. And then finally, I'm going to um, give you some tips about uh, what to do if, if, in fact, you don't follow my advice and do get scammed. So um, that's kind of the outline of where we're going. Uh, questions are welcome along the way. Uh, there hopefully will be some time at the end for specific uh, questions. But uh, I, I like this to be sort of an interactive thing. So if I say something that uh, you know triggers a question, feel free to feel free to jump in. Um, all right. So first topic: uh, warning signs. Um, Obviously, the first step in uh, avoiding getting scammed is an awareness that you may be dealing with a, a scam artist. Well, hopefully, all of you that are sitting here in this presentation or have heard the other presentations um, are have taken that first step, and you realize that there are a lot of really malevolent, deceptive, disingenuous players out there, particularly in the in the cannabis industry, which which operates in sort of this quasi quasi legal. Uh, realm. Um, but here's some, here's some factors that I, I would suggest personally that, that should start you thinking that something might be a scam. And again, some of these are very basic and things you already have all heard people say, and, so, and some of them may not be. Um, the first is, and this is probably the biggest one that I run into, is uh, the, the, the biggest thing that sets off a, a, red, a huge red alert sign for me is when you have someone promising to deliver money or something else to you, and they ask you for money when you're the one that's raising the, <laughs> when you're the one that's raising the money. Now there are legitimate money raisers out there. They're brokers. They're, you know they're registered. They're called broker dealers, and they're you know there to assist with networking and finding capital and facilitating contracts and things like that. But. Uh, there are a ton, as I'm sure many of you have run into, of people who are um, not really as connected as they say they are and not able to deliver on their promises to uh, uh, help you raise money. And so invariably, those people sort of know, it seems, that they're not able to deliver on their promises because they're asking for money right up front, whereas a, a traditional money broker would ask for a percentage of the transaction, a success fee, if you will, when they uh, actually perform for you. So if you're, if you're dealing with people that uh, are promising to help you raise money, but the first thing they ask for is you to sign an exclusive agreement with them and put up money that's non-refundable for a re retainer or whatever, uh, for them to even get going, uh, don't don't be don't be drawn in by that because there's plenty of legitimate money raisers. Yeah. So, um, how do you balance between the person that is, let's say, the legitimate money raiser who has clients that aren't also so fiduciary responsible working with one individual? So, therefore, it's a, an even fairness. 
Uh huh. You can kind of see where I'm falling with this. Um, do you mean people that are true intermediaries and, and yeah, sort so of balancing? Yeah. They can prove yeah. they have legitimate sources. Yep. They say that they actually can do what they is. Yep. They they charge a fee. They don't charge a fee. They right. Exclusive not. How do you balance what they want in regards to their time and energy to help get the deal? At the same time, to also make the borrower feel comfortable or client, excuse me, to yeah. make them also do that. So that's a great question. Um, I, I don't have a, a magic answer to that, but my, my suggestion is this, is um, to sort of probe the issue with them and, and try and maybe propose a structure where they do get some money up front so that you can prove to them that you're credible, but maybe make it refundable if they haven't delivered a certain milestone or something like that. Um, that th they may not go for that, obviously, but just the way they react, and that's kind of the theme throughout all of this, is, is push back and, and see how people react and then trust your own judgment. People are really good at telling you what, they, what they're about, believe it or not. And so if you, if you sort of push back on that, uh, that, that's one avenue I try. The other thing is, I, I found that a lot of people that do what you're describing um, um, maybe hold themselves out more as consultants than brokers. And, you know, they, um, and I, I would suggest sort of a different standard and a different uh, process of evaluating people who are just trying to consult and act as mere finders than I would for people who are painting grandiose visions of raising millions and millions of dollars for you and getting a percentage of that type of thing. So, but again, I don't have any, I don't, it's one of the toughest things I face in the, in the, yeah. in the legal world because it, all the time. Yes. Uh, that we're, I'm Mary Lou and I are business partners in Cannabis Connect. Uh -huh. So we're not brokers and we tell people right up front, we don't have a broker's license, it's not what we do. Yep. So one of the things is if you're trying to deal with a broker, check out to see if they have a broker's license if they say that's what they do. Because they're going to have to have a license. What we Correct. do with Cannabis Connect is we're a finder and we have, yep. have legal language on anything that we put out that says we are a finder and we don't guarantee. We find the people and bring them to you and we understand some basic qualifications yep. but we've not completely vetted them we've not completely you know that that is still absolutely up to um the person who is looking for the, the investment to go through some due diligence but a lot of times people you know even if, whether it's it's money or whether it's hey i'm I want to buy two retail shops, you know, one in Portland and one in Redford, whatever. I mean, how do you find those? And because of the yep. trusted relationship that Mary Lou has gained through through the show, and I'm, and I'm not promoting no. just how we deal with it as a finder, sure. because we got we don't know if yep. people really are going to go out. And, we've had some people. Oh yeah, we're we're taking them all over the place, showing them, and then all of a sudden yeah. they just disappear. And we yeah. spent a lot of effort. You know, and taking them and they do introductions and this store and that store, that retail yep. store and that kind of thing. But it's one of the good things is that because of the Oregon market is getting smaller and smaller, and so some of the, the bad actors are getting squeezed out, but they're, it's not necessarily meaning they're all gone. Yep. But one yep. concept is, you know, ask around too. Yep. I mean, depending on how much you've been in the industry, a lot of people know who bad actors are. Yep. So. You know, it's it's kind of understanding a little bit of you know what's what's you know what's the, the um, undercurrent of what people are saying about so and so yeah. and, so and, so. and and you're you're right on that, that um, just to. I don't want to get into too specific legal advice, but there is a difference between a broker and a finder, and, and people don't have to be registered if all they're doing is, is connecting people and then stepping out of the process, and that's kind of what I think you guys are probably down that path. But yeah, and, and to your second point, um, the daylight is shining on these people. It's a small, tight-knit community, and people are getting weeded out over time, but you don't want to be the one that's in the in the process that yeah. gets, gets, gets scammed. So yeah, exactly. You, yeah, you don't want to be the one that does that, so. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Um, as a finder, how do you take your fees? So we do actually. Yeah. Um, you can take a percentage. You're, you're, said, yeah. Without being a licensed broker dealer, you can take a percentage? You can, as long as it's, it's, a, it's a. Okay. The SEC has a whole range of regulatory guidance on that. But there, there are some at attorneys who believe that um, as long as you limit your activities, 
to just being a finder and don't participate in the negotiation, the documentation, the, the, uh, the, uh, anything other than making the initial contract that you don't rise to the level of a, a, a broker dealer that needs federal registration. So. We, don't, we don't give advice. Yeah. Um, we collect the data uh, and we're creating a database of you know, who are the retailers. We all have, again, Mary Lou, type of person like Mary Lou would get a call and say, hey, I want to sell, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I want to get out, you know, kind of thing. But they don't want to publicize it. They don't want to start putting out on a wherever a feed saying, hey, you know, so and so is selling all their stores. Well, you know, as a business person, you don't put that out there. Yeah. So it becomes a trust thing, too. So, yep. um, and we do confidentiality, you know, non circumstance kind of scenarios too, so that we also don't have, as us trying to do the legwork, we don't um, have a person that goes around this and goes direct to. But. Yep, so, okay, so that that's the. That, that's the biggest warning sign for me. I'm just going to list really fast because we, we have only sort of limited time here. Um, some of the other warning signs, and then I'm going to, I really want to jump into how to how to protect yourself here and then, then talk about the specific um, scams that I'm seeing. So, um, you know, the bullet points that I would throw out in terms of potential warning signs, again, um, if you're raising money, people asking for money up front. Um, two, people offering unrealistic claims that, uh, seem too good to be true. That's sort of the classic scenario. Um, one thing to notice for, and this is this is this is one that I use as an acid test, is if the process itself seems too short or too quick or too easy, that's like the number one flag. It, it you do not raise ten million dollars or five million dollars or one million dollars over drinks and a napkin. There is documentation that is involved. There is lawyer to lawyer conversations. There are back and forth. And anyone that's promising you anything else is, and you know, obviously there's always a sense of urgency for more money, but anyone who's, who's, who's being disingenuous or, or dishonest about what's involved with the process, uh, that, that to me that's a huge red flag if things are moving too quickly or they're short, doing shortcuts in the documents or things like that. Um, it, uh, uh, just a couple more real fast on that. Um, um, a, a thing that I, I, I just see over and over again is that the people who are offering their services for money, whatever they are, they always seem to be claiming to have some sort of secret knowledge that, or new insight that no one else, for whatever reason, has yet discovered. And so the moment I hear someone telling me that, uh, you know, my, my spidey senses go up and I start thinking, you know, this is, this is 2019. We have the internet, we have great <laughs> communications and there's not a lot of secret knowledge that isn't out there. Uh, so th those, are, those are the initial things. So what do you do uh, if, if you've think you might be dealing with a scam here. And um, in, in some of the other presentations, I've seen some of these mentioned in more detail, and so I'm not going to go too deep on this. But um, the biggest thing that I would say, first of all, is check your ego at the door. I mean, these people are very sophisticated now, and they play to your expert. They will play up your expertise and your knowledge and your intelligence and everything like that. And if, you, if you're taking pride in your intelligence or experience or know-how or anything like that they're gonna they're gonna find a way to exploit that so check your ego at the at the door and and you know it's you kind of have to get over the personal it's not a personal attack we're all subject to uh, being scammed and uh, it, it's not it's it's not a bad thing to admit that you're human and it, it's probably gonna protect you more than if you don't um, Triangulate. The, the, biggest, the biggest point that I would say about all this is um, get as much information from as many different sources as you, as you can. Um, you know, get good service providers around you who you know, know the players in the industry, who know the way documents should be structured, the, the, um, who the key players are, um, all those sorts of things. Talk to your network. Uh, ask a lot of questions when you're interacting with people get documents, um, you know, everything you can do to get more, more data and more independent sources about um, whether these people are legitimate or not. I kind of look at it as like pattern recognition where if, um, uh, 
you get one data point, it, it puts one little pixel on the screen, you get another, and, and if you keep getting many data points, then all of a sudden it comes into focus and you see what you're dealing with. But if you only have one data point, you're just left speculating to yourself, is this, is this real or is this not real? Um, I did want to make a plug for a really good book uh, that, that, that I would recommend reading if this is a topic that interests you. It's called The Confidence Game, Why We Fall For It Every Time. And it, it came out in 2016 by a, a Harvard University and, and Columbia University PhD in psychology. Um, and uh, it's just a fascinating read. Um, it, it not only talks from a theoretical perspective about why people get um, conned, but it, it also gives a ton of different real world examples um, as well. Yes, it's called The Confidence Game. And it's, it's a short but really great book uh, by Maria Konnikova. Is her name. Um, and the, the final thing on this particular topic, uh, man, don't be afraid to cut your losses and walk. That's the way these people get you hooked in, is they draw you in slowly and you start building a relationship, you start getting documents, you start investing your time in these sorts of things. and. And it, it helps their credibility, and it, it, it makes it harder for you to walk away. If you, if you are getting a sense that things are awry or not as they seem, there are plenty of fish in the ocean. Uh, just walk away, cut your losses, and deal with someone that you do have, have confidence with. So anyway, those are the generic sort of uh, ideas. Now, the, the, the really interesting part that I, I, I wanted to make sure we get to here. Um, what are the what are some of the most common scams that I'm seeing or we're seeing in the in the cannabis industry? Now, I, I have to give you a caveat. Almost all scams have some legitimacy at the very beginning. So when I mention one of these, I don't want everyone going crazy and saying, that's not a scam, that's legitimate. I just heard of so and so that, that did it. Okay. The, I'm talking about the odds here, and I'm talking about the frequency with which people misuse this concept, uh, not the fact that, um, that, that it, you can't be successful doing this. Um, so the first one is a perfect example of that, and I call it the Canadian Shell Company scam. Yeah. And um, I'm assuming that many of you in this room have run into this. So the Canadian securities market and exchanges are structured very differently than the United States. Uh, they allow these blind pools of capital up there to be raised for what are essentially shell companies. And um, what happens is that you get brokers and promoters up there who have a shell company that they're associated with and get commissions on the, the trades for they run around, because they're just shell companies, looking for interesting businesses to acquire or merge with through the promise of being able to raise capital uh, on the Canadian markets or in the US markets based on the combined entity. And it sounds great on the surface. And, and frankly, I just read an article today about a guy who did that successfully, raised a billion dollars in the cannabis industry. So it, it, it can be done. But more often than not, what I what I see with these companies is that the that if if you if you're not dealing with quality players, what happens is that you go through this intensive process of negotiating these deals, which essentially shift the control of the operating business, your business, uh, to this shell company, which then may or may not go out and raise money effectively or as much money effectively as you want. But you're as the selling company, basically stuck with losing your trademark, losing your company control, losing your uh, assets, all those sorts of things. And I've, I've personally been involved with litigation of several of, of these types of uh, transactions gone awry, and they, you know they sound really great. And I know in Oregon and Washington in particular, there have been a, there's been a ton of interest in people getting financed by Canadian. Um, Shell companies, um, just be very, very wary of those. There, there's a lot of pitfalls in that, and it, the market is regulated differently. There's a lot more promoters and, and things like that. So that's 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 probably the one of the number one uh, items to be wary of. The another one that I would say that you need to be super careful of if you're trying to, and I'm assuming everyone in this room is trying to be a legitimate business. I call it the master grower scam. <laughs> And, yeah, I, I see some. I see some recognition. Yeah, the master grower scam, and basically that. Yeah, there's people that have been in this industry probably 
ha probably have some knowledge and know-how, but have been operating illegally for a long time, and they recognize that as it's become legal, they are able to convince investors who aren't particularly familiar with the industry that they have the know-how to properly run a grow operation, and invariably, no, not, again, I can't say always, but frequently what happens in these sorts of situations is, one, their expertise turns out to be far less than what what was was promised, uh, and the, the quality of the product is, is not good. But second of all, and more importantly, um, because a lot of these people come from the illicit history, the product goes out the back door without without you knowing it as an investor or a board member or whatever. And that's the surest way to lose your license, damage your reputation, face criminal charges, uh, and frankly have a really difficult time resolving that sort of issue because everyone is somewhat complicit at that stage. When, and, and so even the court system is not very good at, at sorting out who did wrong or, or, or not. And I, I, I personally spent months, maybe a year, uh, dealing with one company up in Washington that, that had these sorts of issues and it never, it never got resolved and it's still, it's, they're still battling each other. And it's all because they took on a master grower who, um, you know, made great promises and then, you know, realized that there was more money to be made if you don't have to pay taxes and push stuff out the back door. So that, be very careful about that one. That's a, that's a common one. Um, we already talked about the money finder example, so I'm not going to go into detail about that. But I do want to mention one sort of detail about that particular scam that it's just shocked me that um, I've, I've been seeing um, within the last year come up. It's a, it's a, a variation on this money finder s scam, but what it is is, I don't know who it is, but there's this group that seems to be going around saying that they're affiliated with some very large and well-known Wall Street trading firms and banks, like huge top five banks and, and recognizable investment banking firms and things like that. And they are approaching entrepreneurs in real estate and cannabis and, and other emerging industries and promising them that if the company engages their business in the services, what they will do is they will um, ask for a commitment of capital. You don't have to supposedly turn over the capital, but just prove that you have the money. And then they will go back to their trading buddies on Wall Street or New York or overseas or whatever the scam is at the time, do back-end trading utilizing the money that you've designated for them that you can't touch until this is over, make such a big profit that they will then lend the money back to you at a super low interest rate and therefore you'll get a super low interest rate massive amount of money if you just agree to sign up with them. So obviously this falls into the category of one, don't turn over your money to people like that, but two, they, they're really devious in the way that they um, charge you like these modest like ten, fifteen thousand um, dollar fees along the way to engage them or retainers or whatever. Um, and then once they, because they know that that's below sort of the threshold that most people will sue for, um, and then once they have your money locked up or whatever, then there's this constant stream of promising, oh, the trades are in progress, oh, we're dealing with compliance, oh, we're dealing with, and over and over, and for like years, literally, I have a couple of clients that have been dealing with this for more than a year, um, of, of promises like almost every single day that something's gonna happen. And so uh, if you see one of those um, sort of reverse, loan type of things based on secret Wall Street trading, boy, run the other way, because that's one of the worst scams I've seen in a long time. And it, it's what's so difficult about it is that the people that seem to be propagating it are um, are pretty well respected. They have good pedigrees and they have uh, um, experience in, in the financial world and things like that. And I, like I said, I've, I've advised many of my clients to stay away from, from that sort of thing. Uh, another, uh, another scam that I don't even know whether I'd call it a scam. I guess I would. Um, has to do with the fascination with hemp and CBD that's going around right now. I call it the six, <coughs> six levels deep broker scam. <laughs> I don't know whether any of you are participating in the, in the hemp brokerage or intermediating transactions between buyers and sellers, but it's gotten so ridiculous right now that 
uh, brokers are on the sell side promising crops that aren't there and representing themselves as the sellers when all they have is a relationship to another broker who has a relationship to another broker who maybe knows someone that had some product a year ago that might have been available and trying to hold themselves as a legitimate supply source out to people. Um, and on the buy side, you have all sorts of people who are doing the traditional sort of investor scam type of thing, representing they have money when they don't have it under control. They don't have, um, they, they, they don't actually have the ability to invest it. They're just an intermediary that gets a percentage of the, the money that comes in. And so, uh, uh, in, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I guess it's because the market's so hot right now, and it's a, a relatively newly unregulated industry. But um, the 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 levels you have to go through, the machinations you have to go through to verify the buyer and the seller in a hemp brokering transaction or even just a simple purchase transaction between a seller and buyer are, are crazy. I mean, I'm talking about proof of life. I mean, I've been on phone calls where uh, I'm having to have people literally walk to the crop or the lab, hold up a, a sign that says, this is for Ted Bernhard, you know, here's the date today and here's the newspaper, you know? It's like a kidnapping or something. And, um, you know, on the other end, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm seeing the buyers have become, the, the sellers have become so skeptical that buyers actually don't have the resources that they're literally demanding that the money be in the attorney's escrow account before they'll even talk to to you and the attorney has to write a letter vouching as a fiduciary that that money is available and designated for this. They won't even accept like third party validations from banks and things like that. So that one is just absolutely out of hand right now and it's if you're if you're dealing in that industry at all be, be super duper uh, careful. Um, the other the other two that I just want to mention real fast these are those are the, those are the most common ones that I'm seeing right now. Um, the are the um, sort of too good to be true good Samaritan type of scam. Uh, there's a lot of people I've noticed that are holding themselves out as um, like angel investors that um, are offering to provide pretty large amounts of money to companies, but they have, I mean, I know this sounds ridiculous and terrible, but they have ulterior motives like sex, power, control, things, I mean, just crazy personal types of things that, uh, you know, they appear at, at first to be credible and interested in building companies and things like that, but, you know, down the road, it, it turns out that they're completely disingenuous. And the, the last one that I mentioned along these lines is, um, they're not all scams, but multi-level marketing is, is very prone to pyramid-type scheme, Ponzi types of schemes that the securities um, Exchange Commission does not find legal. Um, it, invariably, in, in rapid growth markets, people take money from one source, spend it, realize they're in trouble, go raise money from another source, and then use it to pay off the original source rather than building their business. And the money just keeps getting shuffled around over and over. You see some of that in this industry as well, but uh, not 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 as I, I'd say not as much as I've seen before. All right, so we're, we're getting close to the, the end here. Um, it, any questions before I kind of want, okay. Um, the, um, I, I want to talk about sort of do's and don'ts if you do get scammed really fast. Um, so first of all, look, we all have the proclivity to get scammed. Um, it's recognizing that fact is part of protecting yourself. Um, if you do get scammed, that's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean that everything is lost. There are things you can do to protect yourself and, and minimize, mitigate the damages. Um, but here's what, here's, what's, here's what I would recommend not doing. Um, and I know everyone, when something like this happens to them, gets frustrated. Um, but probably the worst thing you can do for yourself is self-help. Like, if it involves real estate, going onto the property and trying to seize assets or things like that, is just going to get you into huge trouble if it involves crops. If you don't have the legal right to be on someone's premises, don't, don't, don't do self-help. Pursue the pursue the legal mechanisms for recovering the money. There are plenty of plenty of ways. As I'll, I'll talk about them real fast here uh, to get your money back, uh, or at least attempt to through proper legal processes. You know, liens, garnishing wages, getting judgments, all those sorts of things. Um, also, do not, I, I, 
do not make the problem worse by threatening the other person or engaging in like a social media flame war. I know it's tempting. We all we all have social media accounts, but um, uh, you, you're not going to get any progress by deliberately trying to um, um, and anger someone or, or, or damage their reputation and you may actually be opening yourself up to potential defamation lawsuits or things like that so you don't want to you, you don't want to just go off on the person uh, in, a, in a public manner proceed deliberately quietly and legally uh, and and that's the so um, along those lines who do you who do you call at first if you kind of got if you got scammed well um, a lawyer would be a good person to start with, especially one who's interacted with uh, these types of scams before. Um, but what can a lawyer do, right? I mean, the lawyer can file a complaint, a civil complaint, um, but that's expensive uh, and time consuming and uncertain and involves litigation. Um, the lawyer can send a demand letter to the other people uh, but most of these people that are hardened scammers are not very concerned or um, impressed by that sort of thing. But what a lawyer can do probably um, that might even be more helpful is point you in the right direction of the law enforcement personnel that um, can kind of take it from there. Um, people a lot of times over, I mean, forget about that avenue of, of redress. Uh, but when you're talking about behavior like this that is criminal, borderline criminal, fraudulent, uh, things like that, uh, you call the police. I mean, if someone stole your money, it's theft. And the police may or may not be able to do anything, but you know, theft is theft and embezzlement and conversion and all those um, types of crimes. They, they are crimes, even though it's the cannabis industry. And you know, don't hesitate to reach out to them. Uh, the the uh, Department of Justice in the states and the Federal Department of Justice, uh, they have they have uh, the FBI. They they all have law enforcement capabilities that you can um, alert and, and get them to come after the the perpetrators, alleged perpetrators. Uh, the cannabis licensing board is one that people always think about going to. Um, you know that's a mixed bag in the sense that. If you're the one that holds the license and someone's doing wrong to you, it it makes you look bad to the licensing board. Um, but that being said, you probably have a duty to report it to the licensing board anyway. If there's theft or or wrongdoing or stolen product or whatever. Um, and one other thing I just I just mentioned on that is um, if it's a moderate amount of money. People forget that small claims court is really good for resolving disputes here in Oregon under under ten thousand dollars. So if, if someone's taking five, seven type of thing, um, uh, lawyers are not prohibited in those. I mean, are prohibited in those courts, and um, a lot of times the defendants don't even respond. And so it, it's it's something to consider if there's a, a relatively modest amount of money involved. Um, okay, so in conclusion. Um, I got I to give you a funny, but it's not that funny story. It's actually from that book, The Confidence Game, and it's, it's one of the stories in there that, that stuck with me. And I know it sounds completely ridiculous, but uh, it's, about a, it's about a guy um, that she interviewed in the, in, in the, who, who was scamming people for decades. And this happened in, the I think, the late 70s. Um, the, the, this guy and a group of his buddies... Um, convinced another person in their town that they had inside information on a horse race and um, that if the guy would just give give them their money they would place the bet on the horse and he would win big anyway they obviously they, they pocketed the money they didn't make the bet the horse lost they had no inside information and the guy ended up losing all of his money you know not not just because it lost but because they they pocketed it anyway that as the story goes uh, the the the, the man, a few months later, a few years later, came back and he saw these same scam artists on the street. And they saw him and, and they, were, they were terrified. They thought he was going to come over and beat them up or threaten them or you know, do something horrible to them. But the guy walked over to them with a big smile on his face and he thanked them for trying to help him uh, get this, this inside information and asked them whether he could give them some more money 
in order to make another bet on his behalf. <laughs> so my point is, don't, don't be that guy. At the very, very least, learn from your mistakes. And if, if, if something bad happens to you, you know, mitigate the damages, try to avoid it. You know, but just it's human nature that people can play against these, these sorts of desires. And uh, so be wary of that and, and don't, don't fall into the trap of having it happen multiple times. That's that's kind of the summary. Any any other <laughs> any questions that anyone has before we wrap it up here? It's not as bad as it. It's, it, it I will say one thing, and I'll take your question. It's not as bad as I make it out to be, but it is it is really getting difficult to discern the, the, between the people who are merely mouthing the words of legitimate hard work, long term business building value, and people who are. Um, actually trying to do that and distinguishing between the two of them really requires a concerted effort of, among all your network, your service providers and all that sort of stuff. Yep. So the money person, of course, made me think of that, being a lender myself. Uh -huh. So that's why I asked you the question that I asked. Very common, not cannabis industry specific, to ask for once you receive an LOI or a term sheet that there's a funding commitment. Yep. And so yep. I guess I just wanted you to Talk, talk about that. Here, expand on that. Yes. Yes. Willing to, uh, from your perspective. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, that's that's critical. I mean, um, I, I think I saw your earlier presentation, and and proof of funds is super super important. And um, you know, how do you get to the point where you know that someone actually has the money in their account and the authority? It, it's two things. It's really they have the money, and they have the authority to act on the contract. And so part of it comes down to reviewing their organizational documents and seeing that they actually have the authority to make these decisions, reviewing the transaction documents to make sure that they actually are the right people that you're dealing with. Um, and you know, sometimes people go directly to the bankers and the banking sources and ask them to verify that the funds are in the account. And sometimes you'll get a bank statement or um, whatever. But more often than not, I found that attorneys play kind of a critical role in that and talking attorney to attorney where you can have a dialogue back and forth about, you know, is this money in there? When did you last see it? You know, what discretion does this person have? All those sorts of things resolve a lot of those issues. You know, it's kind of similar to the way the SEC requires you to validate accredited investors. Um, they, they Basically, an accredited investor is a high net worth individual who has a, a, a million dollar net worth or has earned $200,000 a year in the past couple of years. And the companies need to try and verify that before they take the investment dollars. And the SEC has written guidelines as to what that looks like. And that looks like either a bank statement directly from the bank, a letter confidential from your accountant or your lawyer attesting to that fact or uh, pay stubs if it's income that you're talking about. And so those are, that's what I look at as like the gold standard in, and it, it's not really the gold standard, it's probably the minimum standard that you need to, yeah, to, to prove, prove out the funds. But it's, there's so many people, just going back to the very first point in this whole discussion, there's so many people out there that are representing that they have funds under management or access to funds that are really intermediaries that don't have the money that hope to basically use the possibility of doing a deal with a company to go raise that money that, that you just can't be you can't be too careful on that so yeah um, yeah and so that's that's kind of where I'm at I, I would say that um, the cannabis industry is is definitely one of the highest risk for deceptive behavior that I've been involved with in a while so so keep your guard up and but you know there's bankers lawyers accountants uh, um, keep your network fresh and and ask people to verify uh, verify the person's background and things like that um, that's your that's your best protection so anyway thanks yeah.